Okay, uh, so we are rolling uh, through 15 here. We started talking about solutions last time. Um, a reminder, uh, solutions, there's really two parts to a solution. There is the solute, which is the smaller part. And there's the solvent, which is the larger part. And usually the solute is sort of dissolved in the solvent and that makes our solution. These two guys together are typically the guys that get that aqueous symbol as we talked about. Uh, we also talked about sort of solubility of solutions and so forth. And it was the idea of uh, like dissolves like. So things with very similar intermolecular forces or ways that they sort of interact with themselves uh, makes other things uh, interact really well with them as well. So if they do share, they're trying to mix two sort of solutions together, if you will, uh, if they basically have very same characteristics in terms of those intermolecular forces and how they interact with one another, they will definitely be soluble in each other. Uh, if they have very different sort of uh, interactions, uh, they really will not be soluble in each other. So you know, if you have anything that's ionic and polar, those guys are going to be good and soluble. If you have polar and polar things, those also will be soluble. And if you have some nonpolar and nonpolar guys uh, together, they will also be pretty much soluble in each other. As we talked about, though, if you kind of cross over sort of nonpolar and polar, those guys typically will be insoluble in each other. Again, because basically the uh, polar guy is going to be trying to use something like uh, dipole-dipole interaction, hydrogen bonding, uh, while the nonpolar is going to be really strictly using dispersion forces, which are weak temporary forces. And again, over a long period of time, they really cannot maintain that interaction uh, very well. We also talked about uh, ways to classify solutions as being uh, dilute. Uh, concentrated, saturated, and unsaturated, and super, unsatur super saturation, uh, which we did the experiment the other week, uh, where again, we saw that super saturation was a very, very unstable solution. So unstable, I just started to lift it, and it pretty much all the solids sort of came out of uh, solution. Um, we got into, at the end, I believe, some different types of uh, concentration units that we deal with with solutions. Uh, there's some percent concentrations I believe we talked about, which is the percent mass to mass, which is the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100%. There's also some very similar ones, percent volume to volume, which is the volume of the solute divided by the volume of solution, also times 100%. There's percent mass to volume our mass of our solute divided by the volume of solution, also times 100%. And we again can uh, use these as sort of formulas and just plug and chug sort of into the formulas. The one that's really important is the percent mass to mass on the bottom there. You wanna always make sure that you do have the mass of the entire solution. Again, very common, those problems, they sort of separate out the solute from the solvent. Uh, so you wanna make sure you do add those guys together. In terms of the other ones, uh, the volume of the solution is typically just sort of given to you. Usually you don't have to worry about sort of adding anything together uh, in that particular case. We uh, then talked about really the most common unit of uh, concentration, which is molarity, which is moles of solute over liters of solution. Uh, this is really sort of like a formula that you should think about because we use this really to solve for any of those three things there. So sort of being able to rearrange it is really important. Uh, so liters would be moles divided by molarity. And if you want moles, that is liters times molarity. And I would say, you know, outside of calculating molarity, that's probably a pretty important sort of rearrangement of that that we use a lot in chemistry to get to moles a lot uh, using the liters and molarity. If you are using molarity and you are using volume to solve for something like moles or anything else there, the volume does need to be in liters. You cannot leave it in milliliters if you're just sort of using molarity by itself. Um, because if you take actually milliliters times molarity, you get what are known as millimoles and not moles. So 
there would be off by a factor of a thousand. So it's always important to kind of convert it to liters. There are a couple of places where you can leave the volume in milliliters, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But uh, for the most part, if you want to be safe, always convert the volume into liters and then you'll always have moles and really what you're looking for there. Any questions on any of that stuff there that we talked about? All right, so I think we uh, finished up on the KBR example, if I'm not mistaken. So I think we are to here. So we're looking for the concentration of the ions uh, in each of the following solutions. So let's just kind of go over this here together, uh, just to remind everybody of something else we sort of talked about. I think when we started talking about molarity uh, is, for example, if we take this solution here, which is 1.2 molar uh, sodium sulfate, when something like sodium sulfate is obviously in solution, it does not stay together. It does break apart into its ions. And in this case, it would break apart into a couple of sodium ions and a sulfate ion. Now, in terms of molarity, as we talked about, I think uh, last time, there is sort of a relationship between the whole thing uh, in terms of its concentration and the concentration of the ions that make up that particular solution. And you could kind of think of it like a stoichiometry, basically relationship. So when we look at this whole thing, it is basically a one to two relationship between the whole thing and the sodium ions. How that affects molarity is you actually would multiply the molarity by two. And the concentration of the sodium ions that are floating around that solution is 2.4 molar. Well, if we look at the sulfate, it is a one to one relationship between the whole thing and the sulfate. And you would actually multiply by one or just keep the number the same really. And it would be 1.2 molar. So clearly concentration of the ions are not additive, right? 2.4 and 1.2 does not equal 1.2, uh, but it is sort of like proportion. If you want to think about it, you get twice as much sodium ions in that solution as you do sulfate. So the concentration of the sodium is twice as much basically. That is sort of, again, the short way of doing this. The longer way is really a stoichiometry problem where you take 1.2 moles of sodium sulfate per liter. And basically you do the multiple relationship between the whole thing and the sodium ions, which is a, again, one to two relationship. The moles of the whole thing cancel out leaves you 2.40 moles of sodium per liter, which is the molarity that we wrote up there, 2.40 molar sodium. <clears throat> that is actually the long version of that calculation it is much quicker just to go, it's a one to two relationship and multiply it by two, but that is essentially the correct long version of that calculation and how molarity uh, changes. Obviously, if we did it for sulfate, the only difference would be this would be sulfate and it would be a one-to-one, -one, which is, again, why the concentration remains the same. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so we could look at the other one, uh, which is uh, potassium chromate. So when potassium chromate breaks apart, we get a couple of potassiums and a chromate ion. And we could again do sort of the quicker way here. If the whole thing here is 0 0.75 molar, we see again, it's a one to two relationship between the potassium and the whole thing. Gets us basically two times 0 0.75 molar which gives us 1.5 molar. And that would be the concentration again of just the potassium ions in that solution. And again, it is a one to one relationship here between the chromate and the whole thing. So we would do one times 0 0.75 gives us 0 0.75 molar. So this is a very quick way that you could relate uh, the concentration of the whole solution to the concentration of the individual ions that are floating around. And sometimes you're asked, you know, maybe some information about just the ion and not the entire thing. So uh, understanding how the concentration of ions break apart there 
is uh, also quite important. Any questions on any of that there? Obviously, if we had something that broke apart to like a one to three relationship, you just simply multiply the molarity by three for that ion, and that would give you it. <clears throat> any questions? All right, so why don't you try this one? How many moles of sodium ions are present in 42 milliliters of a 0.35 molar sodium chloride solution? So take a couple minutes, see what you come up with. Look, so in this case, again, we're looking actually for just the sodium ions here, not the entire thing. So we could use the relationship like we just talked about to go from the whole thing to just the sodium. Uh, so again, if we think about how sodium chloride breaks apart, it breaks apart into a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And in this particular case, this has a concentration of 0.35 molar. It is a one-to-one -one relationship between the sodium ion and the whole thing, which means the concentration of the sodium ion is 0.35 molar. And by the way, for the chloride, it is also 0.35 molar. Not that we need the chloride in this particular problem, but again, it is a one-to-one -one relationship here. So what that means is really the concentration of sodium ion is 0 0.35 moles per liter. We have the volume of it, which is 42 milliliters using our molarity, which is moles per liter. We're going to solve for moles, which will be liters times molarity. So once again here, very common, we do need to convert this into liters. So that is uh, 42 milliliters divided by a thousand or move the decimal place three places over 0 0.042 liters. Putting that in here and solving it more like a dimensional analysis approach here using our molarity where the moles will go up on top. Leaders will cancel and we will end up uh, with 0 0.0147 moles of sodium in this case. Any questions on any of those steps there? <clears throat> So again, this is a very common sort of calculation, not necessarily the uh, ion part, but actually the bottom part here finding moles using volume and molarity. Again, here you wanna make sure you get this guy into liters for sure. Otherwise you'll be off by a factor of a thousand. So you wanna make sure that you do that. Any questions? <clears throat> All right, so why don't you give this one, Joe. What is the mass in grams of sodium nitrate? that's required to make 2.5 liters of a 0.15 molar solution. Uh, some numbers that would be helpful would be sodium 2299, nitrogen 1401, and oxygen 16. All right, let's take a look. Uh, so obviously we're dealing with molarity. Uh, so we want to think about our equation, which is moles per liter. We see that we are given liters and we all are given the molarity. So really we can use that information to get the moles, which is really good because we are looking for grams because then we could go from obviously moles to grams using the molar mass to do that. So uh, we do need to get the molar mass here, sodium nitrate. Uh, so that's a 22.99 plus a uh, 1401, and we got three oxygens at 16 each. Gives us about 85 grams per mole, I believe, for our sodium nitrate. But we're gonna first start with our uh, molarity here, and uh, we're gonna rearrange and solve for moles. So moles will again be liters times the molarity putting in our liters, which are already in liters. So that's good, our volume. Uh, we're going to use the molarity. Remember, I do highly recommend getting rid of the big M when you do that, uh, or using a calculation. It does mean moles per liter. Number always stays with the moles, always per one liter. It's a very common mistake. People leave the big M and have absolutely no clue again where the volume is or anything like that. So if you kind of put those units in there, 
approach it more like a dimensional analysis problem, you'll always be able to kind of see all the units that you need. And in this case, we would want liters on the bottom here, so everything cancels. And that would get us uh, 2.5, 2.5 times 0 0.150. 0 0.375 moles of sodium nitrate, which as we just calculated our molar mass here will now allow us to figure out our grams. Again, very similar to the calculation you did in the lab the other day. Using the molar mass here, we want the grams up on top. So do we end up with grams? Moles on the bottom, so they cancel. And that would get us not that, put the right number in maybe, try that, all right. I think that's a 31.9 on this calculator. I think that's what it says. Grams of sodium nitrate. So again, if you were uh, to make the solution, you would scoop out kind of like what you did the other day, uh, 31.9 grams of sodium nitrate, add some deionized water until you get to a total volume of 2.5 liters, give it a mixy, mixy, shaky, shaky, and you should have a 0.15 molar solution that is there. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Not even on the mixy, mixy, shaky, shaky part. I understand, that's all right. All right, let's then talk about another very common procedure that we do a lot uh, because solutions are often given to us in a more concentrated solution. Uh, we typically don't wanna use the really concentrated solution. So again, like all the reagents that we use typically in the lab, they have been diluted. So the process of diluting uh, basically will uh, bring down the concentration of the solution. Typically when we do a dilution, the only thing that we're adding really is more solvent. Sometimes people say the only thing you're adding is water, but again, water is not always the solvent in every situation, uh, but uh, we do add more solvent in this particular case. So what ends up happening is the moles of the solute that's there before the dilution and after the dilution is the same, uh, but we do add more solvent. So why does that bring down the, the molarity, for example? Molarity is moles of solute divided by liters of solution which means if we add more water, for example, we are basically increasing this number on the bottom and mathematically what that will do to our molarity is bring the molarity down because we're making the bottom number larger. Top number basically remains the same because all we're adding is something like water or the solvent to it and the molarity actually ends up dropping down. So there is a, a formula that we typically use when we're doing some type of dilution and <clears throat> It is um, this guy here. It is M1 times V1 is equal to M2 times V2. Um, M1 is the molarity, usually the more concentrated solution. V1 is the volume of the concentrated solution you need. M2 is the molarity of the dilute solution typically, and V2 is the volume of the dilute solution that you wanna make. Um, most people roll with this equation here, M1, V1 equals M2, V2, because typically molarity is the most common unit of concentration. You will also sometimes see this formula written C1, V1 is equal to C2, V2, where C is just a generic concentration unit, because technically speaking, you could use something like percent by mass on each side. Uh, you can do percent volume to volume on each side as long as they're the same. But again, most people deal with molarity. So M1, V1 equals M2, V2 is a very common use of it. But again, in books and stuff, they, they've gotten a lot of the year stuff now into C1, V1 equals C2, V2 for just generic concentration. So this is the one equation where if you would like, you can leave the volume in milliliters and everything will cancel out okay because there's milliliters on both sides, as long as they're both milliliters on both sides. Uh, you can convert them into liters on both sides and it'll work out fine as well. So uh, this is the one place where if you're using molarity and you're specifically using this equation, it's okay to leave your volume in milliliters because everything will work out okay. Um, but if you want, you can still convert it to liters. But again, if you're using molarity by itself, like we were doing previously, the volume has to be in liters for everything to work out correctly. But here you actually can because there happens to be 
two volumes on both sides. So they actually will cancel each other out correctly. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Obviously when you make a dilution, it's kind of similar uh, to kind of what you did the other day. Uh, you could use something like a volumetric flask. You have a little bit of deionized water, put your obviously more concentrated green solution in there. Obviously top it off and it gets a little lighter green. So a little bit more dilute in that particular case. But essentially what you did is all the moles of the solute are right there in that little pipette and they all go into the solution. So even though you added more water, your moles of your solute, again, still remain the same in that particular solution. All right. So why don't you give this one a try, see what you come up with. What is the volume of 19 molar sodium hydroxide that must be used to make a liter of 0.15 molar sodium hydroxide solution? Okay, so let's take a look at this. By the way, this is just a dilution. We're starting with really sodium hydroxide. We're ending with sodium hydroxide. Really, the only difference here is the molarity is going down. So that tells us it's a dilution that's going on here. So M1V1 is equal to M2V2, although that looks like it's not equal to. Um, <clears throat> so in this particular case, what we're trying to figure out is we have a bottle of 19 molar sodium hydroxide sitting here. We want to end up making a solution that has a total volume of one liter or 1,000 milliliters and has a molarity of 0.15 molar. So in this particular case, it doesn't really matter sort of which numbers you put on which side, but usually on the left-hand side, it's the more concentrated. Uh, so that would be 19 molar times V1 equals what we are shooting for, which is 0.15 molar and our V2, which is one liter. In this case, V1 would equal 0 0.15 molar times one liter divided by 19 molar. The molarity there cancels out and that gets us approximately 7.89 times 10 to the minus three liters or 0 0.00789 are that is approximately 7.89 milliliters, if I could write it there. First off, any question on the calculation? <clears throat> so what does that number mean? Well, typically if you solve for V1, that is how much of the more concentrated solution you're going to take. So you would go over to the 19 molar bottle and you would take out of there your, I'll just do it in a milliliter, 7.89 milliliters of your solution at that point. Now, since our total volume is 1,000 milliliters, would I add 1,000 milliliters of water in this case, of deionized water? The answer is you would not add 1,000 milliliters of deionized water because your total volume would be like 1,007 or so milliliters, which is not what you're looking for and would not give you the correct uh, molarity. So a very common question in dilution problems is actually not like uh, the answer we just got there, but it is like how much water should you add to make the solution? So typically, if you want to know the volume of water, it is typically V2 minus V1, which means I technically wanted to make 1000 milliliters. I added in there 7.89 milliliters. So if I subtract those to 1000 minus 7.89, and again, I just converted to milliliters for bigger numbers here, gives me about 992.1 milliliters of water should be added. This is our sodium hydroxide. So if I take that and then add my 992.1 milliliters of water, I should now have a total volume that's 1000 milliliters. And when I shake it together again, I should have a concentration there of 0.15. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so typically, like I said, if you solve for V1 is the more concentrated solution. If you solve for V2, it is usually the total volume of your diluted solution. And typically if you solve for M2, it is the concentration of your more dilute solution. So why don't you try one here again? Let's see here. 
So what volume of water is needed to prepare 500 milliliters of a 0.25 molar calcium nitrate solution if you're starting with a five molar calcium nitrate solution? Okay, so kind of same situation. Uh, we want to make a calcium nitrate solution. We're starting with a more concentrated solution. So once again, we got like a five molar solution here sitting of calcium nitrate. We want to make a lower concentrated solution, 0.25 molar of it and 500 milliliters. So once again, this is uh, M1, V1 is equal to M2, V2. Uh, in this particular case here, we have our five molar times our V1. Our desired concentration and volume is 0.25 molar and uh, 500 milliliters. Again, in this case, I'm going to leave it in milliliters because it will work out okay. And let me show you how that all works out. So 0.25 molar times 500 milliliters. And again, if you want to convert it to liters, it's perfectly fine in this situation. And the reason it works out is the molarities here will cancel. It will just mean that when I solve for my answer, I will be in milliliters. If you convert it to liters, when you solve for yours, you would be in liters, obviously, at that point. Um, so in this case, I believe it gets you like a 25, if I'm not mistaken there, milliliters of calcium nitrate. First off, any question on that calculation part there? Now, that means we're going to take basically 25 milliliters of this guy out from the more concentrated solution. But really this question, like a lot of dilution questions, I was actually asking about the water here. Uh, so once again, we could do our volume of water would be really V2 minus V1. V2 is how much we wanna make. V1 is how much we already put in there and we need to throw in about 475 milliliters of water with it. So again, by topping this off with 475 milliliters of water, we now have our total volume of 500. And again, when we mix it, we should have the correct molarity at this point. Any questions on any of that there? So again, uh, one more time, just to make sure if you are using molarity by itself and not in a dilution formula like this, you definitely need to make sure you convert to liters. So again, it's be the one place where it's okay to kind of leave it in a liter. Any questions on dilutions? <clears throat> Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about, I think, is uh, some more stoichiometry, but stoichiometry uh, involving uh, solutions, if I'm not mistaken here. So the good news is in the sense that these stoichiometry problems are pretty much like all the other stoichiometry problems that we've done. It is still the same sort of four basic steps, balance the equation, convert to moles, multiple -mole relationship, and then obviously convert moles into some other unit. The difference here, much like what we talked about with gas stoichiometry is the difference here is usually how you get the moles. So very common in solution stoichiometry, this part, you're going to use the molarity and pretty much you're going to do the ones we've been doing here earlier. You're going to use the molarity and the volume to get the moles. Another common place that's different is at the end, you will always be in moles. So you may be looking for volume at the end. So using the molarity, you may be solving for volume. Liters is moles times, I'm sorry, moles divided by molarity. Or you may actually be looking for the molarity at the end. So those are two common places where you'll use molarity at the end of the calculation. Um, and again, a lot of times volume, but sometimes actually just calculating the molarity is something that you would do at the end because you would be given the volume in the problem most likely, and you would calculate the moles using stoichiometry. So you could use moles and liters to get the molarity. Everything else in between is pretty much the same deal. You got to make sure the equation is balanced. You also do need to make sure that you're not dealing with the limiting reagent problem, right? So if you are, you still need to do the limiting reagent problem. So it is possible to have like a limiting reagent problem that involves two solutions. Uh, it could have limiting reagent problems where you have a solution and a solid together. So, you know, again, if you are given enough information and in the case of solutions, you have the molarity and the volume, 
to get the moles, then you need to think about whether or not you got to do a sort of uh, limiting reagent type problem with it. So let's take a look at one here together and sort of see how it goes. We want to calculate the mass of sodium sulfate uh, that must be added to 250 milliliters of barium nitrate uh, to precipitate out all the barium ions in the form of barium sulfate, calculate the mass of barium sulfate. So if we were going to do this, we would want to start like normal with the equation. So we are looking for the mass of sodium sulfate that must be added to barium nitrate. So those are our reactants. We want to make sure we use the correct formulas. So sodium sulfate is Na2SO4 plus barium nitrate, which is a plus two. So you need a couple of the nitrates there. This should be recognized as a double displacement reaction where it tells you you form solid barium sulfate. So that is definitely one of the guys that are gonna to come together, BASO4. The other guy will be the sodium and the nitrate switching prices there and joining up, which gives us NaNO3. Remember that if you are doing something like this, you wanna make sure you get the correct formulas down first. And then you want to balance it. So you don't want to do it together. Otherwise, you will most likely end up with the wrong formulas. And if we do that, it looks like we are good in terms of formulas, but we need to do a little balancing. I think maybe a two there. And that might be it, I think. So now we are balanced at this point. Any questions so far? So this is, again, much like all sort of chemistry problems we talked about, pretty much step number one. You got to have that equation that's balanced. That pretty much leaves us uh, this piece of information here that's given to us, which is our barium nitrate. We have 250 milliliters and it has a molarity of 0.2 molar. And we are looking for how much of this guy we will make. So first off, is this a limiting reagent problem? The answer is it is not a limiting reagent problem because we only have information about this guy. We don't have any information about this guy. So it's just a basic stoichiometry problem. So we don't have to worry about that. We're going to do the second step, which is convert to moles. And this is where the difference would come in. Here, we are going to use the volume and the molarity to actually get to moles. So the convert to moles here, We do need to change that volume into liters so that the units cancel out correctly. If you divide it by a thousand, that gives you 0.25 liters times our molarity, which I'm going to get rid of the big M and convert it into moles per liter of our barium nitrate. And if I do that, I got uh, something 0.25 times. 0.2 gives me 0 0.05 moles of barium nitrate. Any questions on that part? So that's you know one of the major differences. Instead of again using grams of molar mass from periodic table, volume and molarity here to get to moles. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Third step is still the same. Third step here would be to do the mole to mole relationship. And in this case, it is between these two guys in the boxes, which is pretty good. It looks like it's a one to one relationship, right? So one mole of barium nitrate gives me one mole of barium sulfate. Right? So continuing with my number there, a 0 0.05 moles of barium nitrate. Using the mole to mole relationship from the equation, moles of barium nitrate on the bottom, moles of barium sulfate up on top. Gives me 0 0.05 moles of barium sulfate at this point. Any questions up to there? Now, again, in certain situations, you may use molarity here at the back end. And again, 
solve for molarity or solve for volume if the problem was different. But here we're actually just looking for grams of these um, of these sodium sulfate. So there's two problems. I'm doing the second one first, obviously, in this case. Uh, we are looking for the mass of the barium sulfate. Didn't think I was going crazy there. So we do need to get the molar mass here of the barium sulfate. So continuing on the next page, so I got somewhere to write. Uh, barium is something. I don't even know what barium is. There it is. She's guys closer to periodic tables. I say like 197. I can't read it. 137. Thank you. 137.3. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, sulfur 3207 and uh, sulfate there would be four of those at 16. So that should be our barium sulfate, right? SO4. So that is 137.3 plus 3207 plus four times 16 equals about 233.4 grams per mole. And using our number that we had on the previous slide there, which was 0 0.05, 0 0.05 moles of barium sulfate and times it by 233.4 grams per mole gets us about 11.7 grams of barium sulfate would be produced. This once again would be our theoretical yield in this case. So hopefully you can see it is really the same sort of four steps here. Um, the difference is again, kind of using the molarity to get to the moles. Any questions on that part there? So since I totally blew right past the first part of the question, I'm gonna let you do that part. So. In addition, we are looking for this part here, which is how much of the sodium sulfate we must add. So why don't you give that a go and see what you come up with. You have half the equation there already. So sodium again is uh, 2299. Sulfur is 32.07 and oxygen is 16. All right, so you do the first part there that I skipped, which is what is the mass of sodium sulfate, which would be this guy. That is necessary. Okay, uh, let's take a look. So good news is I kind of did the first two parts for you. Again, obviously, if you're starting with that part, you need your equation, actually you need to convert to moles so that brings us really same two steps here to start this problem uh here the only difference now is we're looking at different stoichiometry not very much different but we're looking between obviously now our barium nitrate and our sodium sulfate which also happens to be lucky there also a one-to-one -one relationship in this particular case so that is where we would pick up the next one our 0.05 moles of our barium nitrate. And again, using the equation there of our one mole of sodium sulfate gets us one mole of barium nitrate to one mole of sodium sulfate. Those guys cancel, gets us 0.05 moles of sodium sulfate. Obviously, we were looking for grams, so we do need the molar mass here. So that is 2 times 22.99 plus 32.07 for our sulfur plus 4 times 16 for our oxygen. Looks like a 142.1, give or take. So using that to convert our moles into grams, 
142.1 up on top, moles on the bottom, so they cancel. And we end up uh, with, looks like, I think 7.10 grams of sodium sulfate. And again, same four steps. First two steps were done for us before, step three and step number four here. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So uh, basically same steps, um, just use that molarity in certain steps along the way. I think uh, we will lay it up here, I think.